Okay, what are we going to do? Um, I want to uh, talk shortly about cough and cough pressure. Uh, this morning we saw uh, none of you use uh, cough tubes, um, so we will talk very short about it. Yeah? Um, we are going to look to the different methods of humidification, the pros and cons of the different methods. We're going to look at endotragular suctioning and tube fixation. Yeah? This is the biggest tube I could find on the internet. It's um, one meter um, 85, I think, and uh, well, it's enormous. Um, it's for an elephant. Yeah. Um, this is more the size we are used to. And um, in small children, in small children, sorry. Uh, the use of a cuff um, is uh, still controversial. However, in peak, peak use, um, we see um, more and more cuff tubes. Why do we see more cuffs? cuffs? Because, an en because an endotragal tube um, can leak, and a cuff uh, is avoiding the leak. And we are avoiding ventilator-associated pneumonia. But how do you control the pressure in your cuff? And you ask somebody, how do you know what the pressure, the pressure in your cuff is? And people um, squeeze in the, pilot, in the pilot balloon. It's known that when you control your pressure this way, um, that it's not reliable. Pressure can be um, close to zero, but pressure can also be 120. That's why we are so afraid of uh, cuffed endotragal tubes, because airway mucosal injury can lead to subclotic stenosis. And this is where we are afraid of. Yeah, that a cuff um, pressure is much too high. So we are c controlling our cuff pressure with these instruments. Nobody is using cuffs. So I don't have to tell you that it's not the correct way to control your cuff pressure. We are going to use this one. It's designed to control the cuff pressure. When it's going to uh, low, he's going to blow some air in it. When the pressure is going too high, he lets some air out of it. So the pressure is uh, really automatically um, being controlled. What you ask why we don't use this one. Who is using this one? Yeah, what, what is happening when you um, are connecting this one to your cuff? Yeah, but all the air is flowing out of your cuff. Going into, um, into the short line you've connected to this one. And all the people are blowing it up uh, to the green area. And the green area is 30 centimeters of water to uh, 35 centimeters of water. We are using a much lower cuff pressure. Our cuff, cuff pressures are uh, maybe 20. So the danger is when you use this one, everyone is, is um, uh, putting air in the, in the balloon until the pressure is uh, 30 or 35. Um, I think this one is the more correct one. Which form of humidification do you use? Which forms are there? You all use, I know for sure, the Fisher Paykel MR850. Is there more on the market that we can use? Not much. Yeah. I don't know if you all um, know this movie, um, but this, um, this man can explain things a, uh, a lot better than I can. So it's a short movie, um, and I hope the sound is working.
inspiration is recovered. However, most is lost to the room. We breathe through our nose. Air passes over the airway mucosa, collecting heat and moisture. This continues until the gas reaches body temperature and contains 100% relative humidity. Upon expiration, some of the heat and moisture added during inspiration is recovered. However, most is lost to the room. Taking a closer look at the gas conditioning process reveals that most of the heat and moisture added during inspiration occurs in the nose. Water vapor molecules are evaporated from the warm nasal mucosa into the cooler gas stream. This evaporation process cools the nasal mucosa, a requirement for heat and moisture recovery on expiration. As the gas travels further into the lungs, more moisture and heat is added until the gas reaches saturation at body temperature. The point at which this occurs is the isothermic saturation boundary. Okay. Uh, there are three, three states of water. We know the solid states of water. Um, and when we add heat or energy to the water, of to the ice, so the ice will change into water. When we add heat or energy to the water, it will change into water vapor. Um, in the hospital environment, moisture or water can be added to the airway in many different forms. We can use water vapor, liquid droplets or aerosols or liquid water, such as inst instilling saline. Does the form of water make any difference? Yes. It does make difference what form of water um, is used to be added in the uh, airway. This is due to the different size these forms take and their ability to carry pathogens. Aerosols, liquid water droplets, Produced by nebulizers are 1 to 40 microns in size. Bacteria and viruses vary in size from 0 0.017 to 10 microns, which is less than the size of some aerosols. Therefore, it's possible for aerosols to carry pathogens to the patient and into their airway. Water molecules are 1,000 times smaller than bacteria and viruses. Therefore, they are not capable to transport bacteria or viruses. The best way of adding moisture to the airway is through water vapor, as it cannot transport bacteria or viruses. We can express humidity in three ways. As absolute humidity, which is the actual amount of water vapor in a liter of gas, the relative humidity, which is the measure of how much water is in the gas compared to its maximum capacity, and dew point, the temperature where the gas is at 100% relative humidity or fully saturated. Um, absolute humidity is a measure of the actual amount of water in a vapor. It is measured in milligrams of liter water, um, a water vapor per liter of gas. Let's say this cube represents a liter of gas of 37 degrees Celsius. If we took that liter of gas and condensate all the water out of it and weight it on a set of scales, that would tell us that the absolute humidity, the actual amount of water in a gas, for this example, is, one, is 11 milligrams of water vapor per liter of gas. Relative humidity is a way of describing how saturated a gas is. That is, how much water vapor is actually in the gas compared to its maximum capacity. 
As an example, let's look at the cube again. On the left, you see that the relative humidity is 25%. The cube on the right is fully saturated. It's 100% relative humidity. Dew point is a temperature where the gas is at 100% relative humidity. Below this temperature, uh, water vapor is lost as condensation. To help illustrate dew point, an example could be the air in your bathroom when we have a hot shower. The air becomes laden with water vapor and liquid water droplets. When this warm, moist air becomes in contact with your cold bathroom mirror, the air lowers in temperature. The ability of this lower temperature air to hold water vapor decreases. The gas then reaches its dew point and this excess water vapor is lost as condensation, which you see on your bathroom mirror. The maximum capacity of a gas to hold water vapor changes with temperature. Warming a gas will increase its maximum capacity to hold water vapor, and while cooling a gas down will re reduce its maximum capacity. For example, on the left are some typical ambient room temperatures of 20 degrees. In a typical air conditioning environment, the relative humidity of room air won't be much more than 40%. If that 20 degree gas was full of water vapor, it would hold 17 milligrams of absolute humidity. Here is a gas at 25 degrees, and currently it's fully saturated with water vapor. So it's at 100% relative humidity, and this means it has an absolute humidity of 23 milligrams per liter. There. However, as we heated the gas up, we have increased its capacity to hold water vapor. So therefore, the relative humidity decreases to 53%. Now let's add water vapor, so the gas is fully saturated, or 100% relative humidity. Notice that the absolute humidity has now increased to 44 milligrams per liter. This is the maximum amount of water vapor the gas can hold at the temperature of 37 degrees. Now what do you think will happen when we cool the gas down to room temperature? The capacity of the gas to hold water vapor decreases, and so the water vapor has to be released. It does, uh, it does so in the form of condensation. Note, the relative humidity remains 100% because the gas is at dew point temperature. Heat and moisture are added to our airways, um, and approximately 75% of the heat and moisture that has been added from the, is added from the mucosa lining the naso and oropharynx. This remaining 25% is added from the mucosa lining the trachea. Let's look at the number as an example. The room air we breathe is typically 22 degrees and 7 milligrams per liter. Absolute humidity and 35% relative humidity. As it reaches the naso and oropharynx, it has been heated up to around 31%, sorry, 31 degrees, 30 milligrams per liter and 90% relative humidity. The bulk of the gas conditioning has already been done. The tragia conditions it further to 36 degrees, 42 milligrams per liter, um, and 100% relative humidity. The point in the airway at which 37 degrees Celsius, 44 milligrams per liter, absolute humidity and 100% relative humidity is reached is called the isothermic saturation boundary. This is the, uh, a really important uh, point, as only once the gas reaches these conditions, normal gas exchange can occur. This boundary is not a fixed position in the airway. It's dynamic and will change depending on the temperature, water content and minute volume of the inspired air. When the 
uh, ambient temperature is cooler, it takes much longer uh, for the inspired air to reach body temperature, fully saturated conditions, and 100% relative humidity. And therefore, the isothermic saturation boundary is further down the airway, meaning the point at which normal gas exchange will occur is moving further down. When the ambient temperature is warmer, it takes a shorter time to reach um, body temperature fully saturated conditions. And therefore, the isothermic saturation boundary moves up the airway. The warmer and more humid the air, the further up the respiratory tract, the isothermic saturation boundary is located. Okay. Every one of you is using the MR850, correct? How does it work? What are the, the how do you, um, how do you set the temperatures? Perhaps nobody is changing the temperature. You are laughing. What, what are the settings in your hospital? The nurse sets. The nurse sets. The nurse sets. 27 degrees. That's normal body temperature. And what will happen with the gas? No. So this is the thing the nurses are doing. Yes. Take a step back to the uh, waveforms and the loops. Who is looking at waveforms and loops in the hospital? Doctors. Doctors. Why? To the, to the air. Do you know it, Anton? Sorry. What's happening to the air? You, you um, put the MR850 uh, 850 on and you put on 37 degrees. And then? And you put water in it. But what will happen with the 37 degrees in that pool of water? In your breathing circuit, the 37 degrees Celsius uh, is uh, getting much warmer. It warm, it's warming the air up to 40 degrees Celsius before it goes into your endocardial tube. Then, it's cooling down to dew point, 37 degrees. When the air is uh, cooling down to 37 degrees dew point, uh, excessive water vapor will uh, come out of the gas. That's why uh, your endocrine tube contains humid. Yeah? So 37 degrees on the pot, 40, 40 degrees uh, close to your patient, 37 degrees into your patient. How can you control it? Three knobs. Normal switch, 
a switch to go from invasive to non-invasive and uh, uh, put the alarm sound off switch. Yeah? When I push that button, I look what happens. On the pot, at the lounge. So what did you do? You made the error now almost 28 degrees in the top and 28 degrees before it goes into the equation. It doesn't see flow now, so it won't change. But when you are ventilating your patient, you will see 37 in the pot, 14 before the air goes into the equation. What happens when we turn it to non invasion? Which temperatures do we see then? Yeah, then we see uh, 31 uh, on the pot. I think. No, okay. 34. Yeah? 34? Okay. 34 on the pot and 34 on uh, the But there are more, there are more um, ways to uh, humidificate your patient. Sometimes, it's not my idea, but sometimes one of these are used. Sometimes uh, there's inst installing of saline. Who is installing saline? Nobody. Who is using aerosols for medication or for uh, humidification? Yes, but I mean for humidification. Yeah. And something in uh, adults is uh, really common is called the Swedish nose or a heat and moisture exchanger. Somebody using um, such a device? Everybody knows what it is. Sorry? Yes. Why? <coughs> Why aren't we using these ones with um, neonates? Yeah, you create resistance into your uh, ventilator circuit um, and an enormous, I think it's coming next to this, uh, dead space into your ventilation. Yeah? In infants it's 2.5 milliliters, but in adults you can see uh, it's 50 to 100 milliliters. Yeah? So I'm glad everyone is using uh, not a Swedish nose, but the MRR 850. Um, what are the downsides of the, those heat and moisture exchangers? Um, they don't produce the 44 milligrams per liter absolute humidity. They only create 17 to uh, 32 milligrams per liter. And they are affected by type of the heat and moisture exchanger, tidal volume, minute volume, ambient temperature, and uh, patient temperature. Here you can see what I just told. You see the water on the pot is 37 degrees, 44 milligrams per liter. In your circuit, it's 
it's being heated further up to 40 degrees, 40 milligrams per liter. And in the last part, yeah, this, it's, a, it's no tube, but it's a swivel connector or something. Um, in your tube, it will um, cool down uh, another 3 degrees. And all the water vapor um, comes out of it. And here you see the difference between the heated moisture exchanger and the heated humidifier. Yeah. What should you use in a new um, in neonates? It's simple. I, I think you should always choose for choose for the MR850. There are no uh, need to use that. I know they use uh, heated moisture exchanger. And I think it's it's, uh, it's okay. Is there a difference in price? Is there a difference in price if you um, choose the heat of Mars exchanger or the MR850? What kind of endotracheal suction do you use? Are you um, uh, uh, suctioning with an open system or with a closed system? Closed. Closed? closed? Nobody open? No? Why not? But, but why not? Why do you use, use a closed system? I think it's okay. I think it's good. But why do you use a closed system? Yeah, and your pedi your pediatric intensive care. What do you, uh, they use? Sorry. What is your pediatric intensive care using? Okay, that's what you see uh, lying there. Yeah. Um, but why are we, um, why do we endotracheal uh, suction? We do uh, endotracheal suction um, uh, to keep the artificial airway patent by rem medically removing the accumulated pulmonary secretions. Um, why? Because the patient's inability to spontaneously remove secretions from, from the airway. Mechanical suction removes secretions, improves gas exchange, and reduces the opportunity of pneumonia. But when do we um, do it? Do we do it as a routine? Each four hours? Or just when it's necessary? Only as necessary. But when, it's necess when is it necessary? I think you need to do um, a suctioning procedure when you see visible secretions or after auscultation, after seeing the blood gases, or when you see your waveforms and your loops, or when looking at your ventilator parameters, parameters or when your patient's coughing. But it's not only a nice thing, yeah? Uh, there, is, there are some complications of endotracheal suctioning. There uh, could be some lesions in the tracheal mucosa. There could be pain, discomfort, uh, infection, alterations of the hemodynamic parameters in the arterial blood gases. There could be bronchoconstriction or atelectasis. And you can see an, an increase in cranial pressure. And these are the two systems that are on the market, the open system and the closed system. And as nobody uses the uh, open system, there's a short movie that shows you how it works. It's a movie from YouTube. Uh, there's not an infant, uh, it's only uh,
This is the open suction method. What do you think of it? Is it more or less um, uh, comfortable, com comfortable for your patient? Yes. This is the one you already know. This is the closed suctioning method. Are you all using this system? Okay, when you look at the uh, first method, the method, method with open suctioning, it's sometimes the, um, necessary to use a self-inflating or an ambu balloon. Um, as I told you uh, earlier, we check the pressures generated when using a self-inflating balloon. What you see is that in more than 25%, the pressure generated was more than 60%. So since that time, we measure all the pressures we are giving manual ventilating with this um, device. So be warned. The closed uh, system of endotracheal suction could have better results uh, related to cardiac frequency, arterial pressure, cardiac rhythm, oxygen saturation, and cross termination. But no difference has been found between those two suctioning systems in the occurrence of ventilator-associated pneumonia and microbial colonization of the endotracheal secretions and tubing of the ventilator. Benefits of the closed suctioning procedure are there's a reduced opportunity for procedure-related infections, they protect caregiver from contamination, they reduce patient-to-patient -patient cross contamination, and you can maintain a closed ventilator circuit. You can maintain uh, oxygen therapy, and you can maintain PEEP. And there's less procedure time. Why is it so important that we maintain PEEP? Anton showed us this morning um, a movie of a couple of um, alveoli ventilated with a low peep and with a high peep. This is um, uh, another movie. I must turn the sound off. Where you can see, uh, you see here a lot of atelectasis, there and there, and every breath they are, go, uh, they are giving someone more peep until all electricity is, mo is um, gone. Some here. What will happen? when you now open the ventilator circuit to do an opening suction procedure. Watch. Now the lung is completely open. and all atelectasis are back. In the next movie, this one, you can see them pop open. When you watch here, you can see them pop open after this connection. It's 
start again. And these are the closed suctioning systems. Everybody is using uh, some kind of um, closed suctioning system, so I think you all know how they work. Yeah? Okay. What you see here, in the connection with the endotracheal tube, here the place to put your ventilator circuit, and here a line. Where do you use this line for? Sorry. To putting in some saline? Yeah. And what for do you what do you uh, use the saline for? To make your patient cough, or to um, um, clean your system? Why do you in install saline? It's easier to push out the tube, to pull the secretions out of it. You mean? Yeah. What do you say? It's easier to pick up secretions. Okay. <coughs> to you, um, measure how deep you have to uh, do the suctioning procedure, you can use the uh, stripes on the on the catheter. Now a different one. Yes. Yeah. I agree with you. I agree completely. Head movement, suctioning, patient care can cause instability and displacement of the tube. Where the tube is too short or too high, ineffective ventilation can occur. And when your tube is too long or too deep, collapse or uh, selective ventilation can occur. And in larger children and adults, it's much more easier. There are ready-to-use tube fixation systems on the market. But how do we fixate our tubes? How do you fixate your tube? Do you uh, fixate it with uh, a plaster or with a tube lint? Which method do you choose? Tape. Yeah, we, we, use, we use tape also. Anybody is using something else? Use the Neo bar. The Neo bar. Is it this one? No. Something like it? Yeah. It's something like this, but smaller. Yeah. It's something like this. This also isn't on your face. So in adults and children, it's quite easy to fix your endotracheal tube. Uh, but in neonates, um, there are no trials comparing various techniques of fixation. Um, this is the way uh, we, fi we fix our endotracheal tubes. And I think this is the way most 
hospitals uh, will do it. Yeah, with a plaster. There are some um, ready-to-use systems for neonates on the market. I don't know if everyone, if, uh, someone used this before. Nobody, I'm, I'm not sure um, how it is working. This is how we are doing it, with one plaster uh, over the nose and one plaster um, on the upper lip. Yeah. Are there any questions? No? Thank you.